Good morning, everybody. I'd like to give you all a warm welcome to as uh, uh, resumed uh, services here in person. PA is not working, sir. Um, <laughs> After that short little uh, hiccup, uh, I believe that the sound is is working. As, uh, can you all hear now? Oh, lovely. So uh, I'll give you the a warm welcome uh, to our service this morning. There is um, uh, there's not too many notices except that next Wednesday will be our a sweet hour of prayer at 1.30, and you'll all be invited uh, to, that, uh, to that service. Also, uh, I'd also give a, a welcome to our minister, the Reverend Graham Bradbeer, as this is his uh, first service uh, to, as a congregation since he's returned from his holidays and uh, lockdown period. And so we, uh, we give you thanks for, for Graham with his safe return, and I'll now hand over to him. Good, thank you, Graham. Thank you, Keith. It's nice to be back. Uh, we enjoyed our four weeks away, two weeks with family and the second two weeks we were in quarantine, so not quite away, but uh, we managed to enjoy those as well, so that was very nice. So thank you for your welcome back. It's nice to be with folks in church, and uh, as Keith prayed earlier, for those of you who are watching the stream, we're very glad you're with us as well. We're going to begin with prayer. Shall, shall we unite our hearts? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the great privilege of coming to, to you in prayer. We, uh, we believe, as the book of Acts reminds us, that it's in you we live and move and have our being. We are invited to trust you, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the whole earth. And so we want to worship you this morning and to realize what a privilege and a presence it is to be in your presence and to know your blessing through Christ our Lord. So, Lord, speak to us in this time. Do us good above and beyond our asking. Touch each one of us, whether we're here in, present, in, in person or whether we're watching the stream. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Now, our opening hymn is Hymn 100. Uh, this is a 3,000 year old song and as I've said before if a song is, is known 3,000 years after it was written it has to have some uh, value just for that reason alone. And this is a summons to the whole earth to sing praise to God. So I invite you to join with us as we sing the 100th uh, psalm. The words are on the screen. All people that on earth do dwell. Thank you, Shirley. Amen. Mm -hmm. 
just to make sure you're on your toes as well uh, as me, uh, you'll notice that I've already prayed a prayer of invocation. So uh, I'm slowly getting back into the stream of things. Christine is going to bring us young at heart now. Thank you, Christine. And just before I begin, when you leave, you'll see on the seat at the left in the foyer, there is a bag absolutely full of lemons. We knew our neighbor, Andrew, next door, was going to leave some lemons. We thought just enough for me to make a few jars of marmalade, but we would have marmalade to last us for 20 years. And I frankly couldn't be bothered anyway. So if any of you can use lemons, please feel free to help yourself. Sorry, we have not organized with bags to give you. And the other apology is that due to oversight by two humans, so it's not a technical glitch, it's a human hit glitch, there are no illustrations to go with this. Irene has them, she has the photos, but they're not on the screen. Okay, I think you know that I enjoy watching some sport on TV. For example, tennis and the Olympics. I don't watch all day and when I'm watching, I'm often doing something else and sort of listening with one ear and watching, looking at the screen occasionally. As a result, I have found myself putting a question on Facebook to get the name of the BMX rider whose brother had suffered brain damage. Now, very quickly, the first response came from an, the wife of another Scottish Presbyterian minister who she watches, she watches more sport than me. Anyway, she said, it's Saya Sakak. Sakaki Bara and her brother is Kai. You've probably all caught up with, because even if you didn't watch the Olympics, it was on the news. Father, Saya's father has been watching her perform from home in Australia, while her mother, her grandmother, and her brother Kai have been in Japan and every race she dedicates to Kai, who has suffered severe brain damage from a BMX accident, is making a good recovery, but has a way to go. So Friday, we sat down to have our soup for lunch. I switched on Channel 7, just as Saya, the sister, was involved in an accident. I'm a wuss. I started crying and said, lightning can't strike twice. And then we prayed for Saya and her family as we waited for an update. We found out quickly that she was talking to her stretcher bearers, so we thought, hopefully, no brain damage. There have been other touching family moments in the Olympics. Footage of very excited families, including grandmothers, watching from home. Kelly McKeon blowing a kiss, a kiss skywards, remembering her father, who died of brain cancer last year. It was clear to me, and I think all of us, over and over again, how important loving support of family and friends is in any achievement. Recently, our youngest daughter has asked me to proofread an assignment she'd written as part of her psychology degree. Research had shown that the two most important factors in whether a student succeeds in and completes a course our personal motivation and support. Other factors are much less important. In quarantine, we finally unpacked all of our framed photographs. 
Some have been in boxes at least since we left Hawthorne in 2014, as we couldn't work out where to put them. Some we then acquired when Graham's mother died in 2015. Some are very old indeed. I thought of the big biblical verse in Hebrews 12. It refers to us being surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses and then adds, let us run with patience, let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. And I gave thanks as we looked at these very old photos for all those people who have nurtured us along life's journey. Of course, and this has been very obvious, strong support and encouragement can also have its downside. We have seen numerous athletes visibly distressed after not reaching their goal. One, call, one listener on 774 rang in to say she was weary of reporters saying to a visibly distressed athlete, how are you feeling? Disappointment is often compounded by the feeling of having let down a loved one. To come back to Saya and her accident, she was not seriously injured and she came back to the track to watch her boyfriend race. Sadly though, this is how she felt. This is so disappointing, it was. I feel I have let everyone down, especially my brother. Now, I'm sure on reflection, Saya will be glad that she was not seriously injured, unlike her brother and also the, per the husband of the person she crashed into became paraplegic after an accident. It's st hard that she still feels, having done her best, that she let her loved ones down. Now, I come back to Ash Barty, one of our sports people I very much admire, with, and her parents too. Her parents brought Ash up to believe that it is much more important to be a good person than a good tennis player. So far, despite disappointments in the Olympics, Ash is showing every sign of being both. Of course she's disappointed when she doesn't play well, but that's not what defines her. Some of you may have seen footage of Ash Barty's mindset coach. They earn big money, but they have a lot of people to pay. So he's her mindset coach, Ben Crow. He spoke of FUPO, which I think is got to the screen. Now, I'd heard of FOMO, fear of missing out. But I had not heard of FUPO, which is, anyone know? Fear of other people's opinions. So there you have it. Now, one of the poop people for whom I gave thanks when we were unloading, well, I often do, actually. I don't have a photo of him. He's a man called John Edward Mackay. The Scots are into several names. He was, and he was known as John Edward. He was in charge of our Sunday school. And like most men in that congregation, possibly all, he'd left school at 14. He and his wife had no children, but we in the Sunday school were their children. And I remember him often in prayers in church, quoting the verse from Romans 14, verse 4. It is to his master he stands or falls. That, it's a verse in the context of telling us to not be quick to judge others which we do. And as we can judge others, we can often worry how, or at least think about how others are judging us. Our only concern should be how God sees us. Now, I know at times 
we feel we let God down. But the wonderful news is that once we come to Christ, God sees us complete in him. And that verse is from Colossians chapter 2, verse 10. So we, may we all keep enjoying Olympics if we do, but may we all remember that God is our judge and he doesn't judge us as we are on our own. He sees us in Christ. Thank you, Christine. Uh, Tibor is going to bring us the scripture lesson this morning. So thank you, Tibor. Uh, today's reading is from Acts chapter 11, verses 19 to 30. I'm reading from the New International Version. The Church in Antioch. Now those who had been scattered by the persecution that broke out when Stephen was killed travelled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus and Antioch, spreading the word among only Jews. Some of them, however, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. News of this reached the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he arrived and saw what the grace of God had done, he was glad and encouraged them all to remain true to the Lord, and with all their hearts. He was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and a great number of people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, and when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. So for a whole year, Barnabas and Saul met with the church and taught great numbers of people. The disciples were called Christians first at Antioch. During this time, some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. One of them, named Agabus, stood up and through the Spirit predicted that a severe famine would spread over the entire Roman world. This happened during the reign of Claudius. The disciples, as each one was able, decided to provide help for the brothers and sisters living in Judea. This they did, sending their gift to the elders by Barnabas and Saul. Thank you, Tibor. May God bless the reading of his word to us this morning. Your offering will now be received. Thank you, Heavenly Father, that we stand in a tradition of giving, that the church from the beginning has given to those in need and for the cause of the gospel. And we, we are grateful that we are in a position uh, to give, to mirror something of your own generosity in our lives. So accept these gifts and us who bring them, that your name might be served and your kingdom come. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Our hymn is 109 in the, uh, in the hymn books. We sing the praise of him who died. Hymn 109.
I cast around looking for some kind of image to go with the theme today, and I found it quite a challenging challenging task. Uh, And and I chose this theme. It's uh, simply a cross. Uh, And I'll come back to it a little bit more. But I'm putting it to one side and just reminding ourselves that this is the image that has something to say to us about the service today. And as you think about what Tibor has read and look at that image, just wonder what strikes you. Uh, the heading of, that I've given the service is that God has broken through to other nations. Now this is uh, the words of Acts chapter 11 verse 18 from Eugene Peterson's translation, The Message. God has broken through to other nations. We shouldn't be surprised that this idea was uh, in the Bible Because we've just sung Psalm 100 uh, to open our service today, and it's an invitation to the whole earth to sing praise to God, to come with joy before him. But it's the song, it's a poem and a song, written by a tiny group of people in the world scene in in Judea. It's their song. How, How would this open up to the whole world. Well, we know that it was there from the beginning, from the very first book of their holy scriptures. The promise was that through them, blessing would come to the whole earth. Somehow that seemed to get overlooked. They found it hard to be God's people. Um, Why didn't God choose some other people? That's what I've heard one Jewish person say. It's been hard to be Jewish. And so... Here, here is this challenge. How, how is this tiny uh, nation of people to be a nation that brings blessing? It was a nation that got trampled on by the other great powers. They were taken captive in Egypt of the, in, the, in the time uh, of uh, Joseph and his family. Uh, they were trampled down by the Assyrians in uh, uh, 722 BC. They were de- devastated. Uh, the re- rest of the nation was devastated by the Babylonians in 586 BC. And yet they had this, this hope that God would somehow work through them. That indeed the house that they rebuilt, the temple, remember in Isaiah, uh, it, Isaiah says that, that, that the temple would be a place of prayer for all nations. All nations. And Jesus quoted this, you remember, in the synagogue at Nazareth. This is what what, uh, was expected, that that somehow it would break out. And yet the truth was very different. So it seemed. Uh, The criticism, uh, the the Jewish people were so insular, so different, so defensive. They kept themselves apart and separate. They were as socially unconnected with other, other nations as you could almost be. There were exceptions. Josephus, the Jewish historian, saw where the power lay, and he wrote a history of the Jewish people, but he wrote it for the Romans because he had sided with the Romans. So we have Josephus' writings about the the history of the Jews, and we have Josephus' writings about the history of the Jewish wars, including the war with the Romans in uh, 70 AD. Josephus was roughly contemporaneous with Jesus. But they were so different. And Rome found them so different and so difficult to manage that even though they had client kings in the country, in the end, they just devastated the country and annihilated and destroyed the temple in the year 70. And the event was celebrated on the Arch of Titus in Rome. If we ever get a chance to travel to Rome, go there and see it and see the Jewish menorah being carried by the triumphant Romans. They had wiped the Jewish people out of Israel. And yet, Jesus had said that the city would be destroyed. He said, when you see Jerusalem surrounded by armies, 
Remember your salvation is coming near. And so what happens in this little passage that's been read to us is really very momentous. God has broken through, Luke is telling us in Acts. And there are four things I want to say to you. The first is I want to point out that back in Jerusalem, Peter had his critics. I want to take you to Antioch where believers talk to Gentiles. I want to take you to the word Christians, which is a nickname that stuck. And I want to think about the authentication of the faith. So firstly then, Jerusalem, Peter had his critics. Um, Just as Peter relayed last week uh, to Cornelius the vision that he'd had, so when, when God breaks through and the reports come back from what's happening in Antioch, the Jerusalem Christians are puzzled. They want to know what's happened. Peter, is, is, has, uh, he's, he's hearing, first of all, a, ch- a question about his going into a house of a Gentile. There were some people who were so shocked that he would do that. What has a good Jew got to do with going into a Gentile house? Well, Peter doesn't give a... Uh, an explanation in a sort of a point by point case he just says this is what happened and he describes his vision and then he tells us something that he didn't tell us in the previous chapter he mentioned that the brothers went with him but but here he talks in chapter uh, in this chapter uh, Acts 11 and verse 12 he talks about six brothers why did he take six brothers William Barclay, uh, an older commentator on the book of Acts, a uh, very uh, learned uh, uh, Scot, I might say, a Glaswegian, I believe, uh, who died in 1978. William Barclay uh, had great knowledge of uh, classical Greek and of New Testament Greek, which he taught. And he makes the point that in, in both Egypt and in Rome, seven witnesses confirmed a message. Seven. And so here's Peter saying, I took six with me and we went to the house and told what God had done. We were there because Cornelius invited us. So, so Peter's critics, they, they, uh, this was going to be an issue that rose again. Paul has to deal with the question in Galatians. There are some people who are saying, oh look, if you really want to be a follower of Jesus, you need to become a Jew first because Jesus was Jewish. You need to eat the food we eat. You need to have our rituals and our ceremonies. But Peter's saying no, and the church had to deal with this question later on. But thankfully, what he said in uh, Jerusalem was enough to persuade the critics that the Gentiles too had received the Holy Spirit. And this was enough to persuade the critics that God makes no distinction between races. He grants his spirit irrespective of the culture you come from. If you receive the word of God and believe, as it's mentioned in chapter 11, verse 1, and chapter 15, verse 7. And so we have uh, Peter's defense of this position. You'll notice that it began way back. uh, Philip went to the Samaritans, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now Peter has gone to a, a, a Roman, to a Gentile, at the invitation of the Gentile. And his family, they receive the Spirit. But today something different is going to happen. And to, do, to discover that, we go to the city of Antioch. Now, I'm, I'm expecting that I'm, you may, maybe don't know a lot about Antioch. You've heard it's mentioned in the Bible. I want to take you to Antioch for a few minutes. Antioch was the third, William Barclay says, it was the third city of the empire. I've looked at different lists, and it's always listed in the top five cities of the Roman Empire. Rome was the mother city, and then uh, Alexandria, which had been established by Alexander the Great. Uh, Then uh, he lists uh, Antioch, then Ephesus, and then there's a big debate which comes next. Some would say Constantinople, which was to become, in a few centuries later, the great epicenter of the uh, Christian world before it was overrun by the Muslims in the 6th century, 7th century. So, so here is Antioch and it's, it's on this river and it, I, as soon as I saw this artist's impression it gave me a kind of feeling of like 
it's a bit like Paris. I don't know if you know there's islands and bridges across to it. Uh, here is a map of it that I put in the leaflet, and you can, I don't know if you're able to see it because it's very tiny. And actually, if you orient the map the same way as the city, there are a couple of details which I'll point out to you. Uh, the first is Main Street. Romans always liked Main Street to go straight through the middle of town. So here it is. And this is, it's called Syrian Antioch because there were two cities called Antioch. They're named after the same person. Uh, he named them after himself, that is. He was, he was a, one of Alexander's generals. Uh, and it's on the river, uh, the river Orontes. I don't know if you've ever traveled on a P&O boat. P&O love to name their ships with the letter O. And so the Orontes was one of their ships. And so here is this river. I never realized there was an Orontes River. And here is uh, the theater. We, we know that, uh, that uh, Roman cities always have these amphitheaters built into the hillside. Well, there's one in, uh, in Antioch. I've actually probably spent too much time looking at Antioch on the, on the computer this week because I discovered that in 1933, uh, Princeton University was invited to send a, an archaeological team to dig and discover the city because it hadn't been really uncovered. It was just known that this was where it should be. And there was a, a modern-day city there. Well, modern in 1933 in the Middle East was pretty old-fashioned by our standards. But this team went, and not only did they have photographs of the dig in black and white and color, but they also had some films of the digging. And so you, you had this scene where there were all these olive trees, but each one was on a little island. And at the sides of the island, they dug down about my height and discovered that this was where the city was. And as they kept going, they found dozens of mosaics on the floor. Those mosaics from those Roman city are now in museums around the world, as well as in Turkey. So uh, this was a city where people indulged themselves. It was at the end of the Silk Road. If you go down Main Street and head off, heading east, uh, you're going to come eventually to China. This is where the silk came from. You'll come back through Afghanistan. You'll come back and you'll bring the silks and the spices from the east to the west. So it was a trading city. The Hippodrome, what's... Um, I'm just wondering how many people know what the word hippo means in the Greek word hippo. Horse. Yes, it means horse. Yeah, that's right. So uh, hippopotamus is a river horse. A hippodrome with us is a race course for horses. All right, so... Uh, the race courses for horses weren't grass the way our race courses are. They were long and narrow and they had chariot races running down one side, a 180 degree turn and coming back the other way. This was a place where people went for the races, for the spectacle. Uh, and you can see that there's a hillside there and there was, uh, according to uh, uh, William Barclay, there was uh, uh, the goddess Daphne was worshipped there. Daphne seems to me an old-fashioned name. Uh, it's, it's a name which is, has a, means a plant nowadays. But, of course, Daphne was a Roman goddess as well. She, became, she was turned into uh, a plant uh, because Apollo wanted her. Anyway, that, that, that's enough. But this was a pleasure city as well as a trading city, and people went there. And what we read was that after, after the persecution of Stephen, way back when we read that in Acts chapter 8, after that, the disciples, the believers, were scattered. And we read, Tibor read for us, that some of them went up and they went to Phoenicia. They went to Cyprus and they went to Antioch. And they talked to Jews only. But it says that other, other, other believers came from Cyprus and Cyrene to Antioch and they spoke to Hellenists. They spoke to Greek people. And the interesting thing is they're unnamed. How did this break through from inside the confines of Judaism? How did it burst through to uh, non-Jewish people? And the answer is that it was in the conversation of unnamed believers. And I think this is just really a, a beautiful testimony to the fact that God is at work, uh, even despite what we as as uh, Christian believers might be saying and doing, God is at work in people's lives. God will use our words. He'll use our conversations. 
And God will change people. So here it's unnamed believers. So that there's no one person to be lionized in all of this. I suppose if we were to pick up one name that Luke mentions, it's the name Barnabas. Um, I, w- I want to, to think, uh, before, we, before I mention Barnabas in any more detail, let's imagine we're, we're going to go to Antioch. Here's, here is a Roman road leading into Antioch today. Right? It's still paved. It's uh, more than 2,000 years old. How many of our roads last 2,000 years without much maintenance? Well, the, the Roman roads are there. And I want to just think about some of the words that have been used to describe believers Let's think, first of all, about the disciples. They're called disciples. A disciple is somebody who learns a discipline. The discipline of learning a musical instrument, for example. The discipline of particular study. The disciplines associated with growing garden, a garden. There are all kinds of disciplines. And there are Christian disciplines as well. They're learning about Jesus. There's something to be learned here. So Christians, in a way, can be described as people with L plates on. You know, there's a bumper sticker that says, uh, I'm not perfect, but God hasn't finished with me yet. I don't know if you've seen that one. And it's good to remember that we're in a process of being conformed more and more to the mind and will of Jesus. So that's the first thing. In Acts chapter 6, the disciples are called, uh, they're called disciples, and that means learners. In Acts chapter 9, they're called saints, a misused and misunderstood word nowadays. We tend to think of saints as people who have been canonized by an ecclesiastical hierarchy and have some elevated status and powers. And so, but that's not the way the Bible uses it. The Bible uses saints to describe the fact that the Christian people were kind of different. They were set apart. They revered the name of God. They... They, uh, they, they will take life seriously because it matters. Uh, they'll take your life seriously and be concerned for you because it mat- your life matters. There, there, are, there are things about Christians that show the, set them apart. Of course, the God of Israel was a God who was set apart. And that was one of the things that the Jewish people found hard to remember because they were kind of seduced by other gods again and again. The God of mammon, money. You can't serve God and money, says Jesus. Only one can be the master. And there are other gods. The goddess of pleasure and so on. So there are different other things that you know, we are maybe tempted to conform to, but we're, our lives should be distinctively different. There should be something about us that people find uh, attractive and winsome. But that's not all. They're called brothers and sisters in Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 9. And this is about a new and emerging sense of family. There are people you care for in ways that you care for your own family. Well, of course, your own family is unique. But but these people love me too. And they are my brothers and sisters. And and, uh, they want to to, uh, encourage me in my life. And so there's a sense of... God being our Father. And this is what Jesus said would happen. When you pray, pray, our Father. And suddenly we become brothers and sisters by that prayer and God's children together. So here's our new word, uh, the brothers and the sisters. And then there's there those who are being saved. There's a lot of futility in the world. And uh, the word saved has the idea of being rescued. And we love the idea that Bondi has a rescue team. You know, Bondi Rescue, the lifesavers are there every day of the year. We, we, uh, we're so p- proud of our uh, SES services. We, we're uh, in awe of the work that firemen and policemen are called to do and, and others, the AMBOs, uh, those who are the first responders. We're happy about that kind of salvation that sort of contributes to the rescuing of our physical lives. But what about our moral and emotional lives? What rescues us from futility, from idolatry, from hopelessness? Well, you matter to God, and God will rescue you from that. And he will conform you more and more to the image 
of his Son by his Holy Spirit. We are being saved. We've been turned from darkness to light. And as the Bible says, whereas once we loved darkness, now we, we love the light. And then another word for these disciples, the saints, the brothers and sisters, those who are being saved, is the followers of the way. And this is uh, one that's particular in Acts. Luke likes this idea of them being followers of the way of Jesus. It suggests we're pilgrims. We're moving on a journey. Uh, We're going forward. How often do you hear our politicians talk about going forward? Going forward, we're doing this. Going forward, we're doing that. Well, if we're Christians, we are going forward. But we need to be careful about which way is forward. And what is the way of Jesus? Where is that taking us? So here is a range of words that are used to describe the early believers by Acts, by Luke in Acts. But there is another one, and it's represented in this cross that I chose. And it's the word Christianos. If, if you, uh, we're all a little bit familiar with the Greek alphabet. You've heard of the Alpha variant. You've heard of the Delta variant. Well, here's the word Christ. It's chi. The, the X in Greek is a CH sound. Uh, the, the R looks like uh, that's the letter rho. I hope we never get to the rho variant of, of uh, coronavirus. The I, the S is a sigma, and the T is a, like our T. So this is Christianus. And this is the word that was first used in Antioch. In Antioch, It was a put-down, really, a bit of a light-hearted put-down. These people are always talking about Christ. And presumably they thought this was a surname, just as Marcus Aurelius and others had uh, family names and uh, given names. So they probably thought, well, uh, this must be the surname of the Jesus they're talking about. John Stott says it reminds us that Christ was at the heart of the Christian message. And this word, which we use to describe ourselves so often, uh, comes from Antioch. And it, it, like the other terms, speaks significantly about, about characteristics of the believers. This time, it's that they are Christ-centered in their thinking. And as a church, we should be maybe think to ourselves... We're happy to take the name Christian, but if we go back and look at these images and think about the idea of uh, learning, of being, uh, being shaped in a, in a particular way by the, the way we think and pray, if we think about the idea of belonging as a family and of, about being rescued from things that we used to, but we've turned from because we, we see a, a sort of futility and a hopelessness down that path or this path, And it's Christ who leads us and we journey in his way. How true are these things of us as a church? Are we learning? How do we feel about one another? These are uh, personally and socially relational terms. It's not about a building. It's not about money. It's not about so many things that we can get sidetracked into thinking. These people in Acts, these are the Christians. And I want to just finally pick about a few minutes to say uh, there's an authentication provided in this letter which challenges us all. And um, there's a beautiful correlation here. It's between Acts 2 and 4 on the one hand and Acts 11 where we are at the moment. What does it say in Acts 2 and 4? Well, you remember in Jerusalem at the very beginning... Uh, There were people there who had come as pilgrims to the city and they were learning about Jesus, but they had run out of resources. They couldn't go back. They'd stayed, outstayed their their financial resources. And and of course, the most vulnerable were the widows. And, And so the church decided that they should be catered for. And the idea was that each of them should receive according to their need. The church was going to be generous and Uh, Give to meet the needs of the widows. And what do we discover in Acts? Well, we discover in Acts 11 that the the, uh, Antioch Christians, the new word that's come into the vocabulary, 
the vocabulary not just of Antioch but of the entire Western world, this, these people are going to be described as a people who give according to their ability. It's a wealthy city and they've heard from Agabus, a uh, prophet, that there's, there's a, uh, going to be a famine and that famine hit in the, in the reign of Claudius. Claudius was emperor from 41 to 52 AD, so it was in that time frame uh, that this, uh, there was great need in the church in, in Jerusalem and the believers, the Christian believers, the ones who were of Greek-speaking background, who weren't part of the Jewish family, they determined to give according to their ability to meet the needs of the, uh, the Christians in Jerusalem. Now, so what is the authentication of the message? Well, I want to suggest we have a few common or garden sayings. We talk about where the rubber hits the road. You've heard that saying? Um, I was reading through the week of somebody trying to explain uh, some of this kind of saying into to a person who isn't a native English speaker. Uh, and if you literally trans translate it, what does it actually mean to another person if they don't have that saying? It's quite interesting. So what do we mean where the rubber hits the road? Uh, when, and uh, perhaps uh, I'll, I'll have a go, but here we go. When the rubber hits the road, it seems to me, when, when actually you get moving, where will it take you there? You know, will, is it up to it? Will it do the job? So, um, so how does it work out? Uh, put your money where your mouth is. You've heard that. That's another funny one to try and translate into another language. If they don't have that saying, what does it mean? They may have a saying that means something similar, but it seems to mean that you're speaking about something, but how does it affect your money, your hip pocket nerve, your resources? I've already referred to Jesus saying you cannot serve God and money. So the question is, does your money serve your God? Or is your God uh, just uh, lip service because your money determines your life? Put your money where your mouth is. Well, what we found uh, in uh, Antioch was that it worked in the lives of these Christians. We asked, does it work? I think we've got a saying about a two-bob watch. I don't know if anybody here remembers a saying about a two-bob watch. But a watch that costs two shillings is not going to be found on the wrist of our session clerk. Is that right? Always before service, Keith looks at his watch, long jeans, and says we've got 15 seconds to go, or however much it is. Very precise. A two-bob watch wouldn't give you that time. In fact, a two-bob watch would probably have stopped quite a while ago. So does it work? That's the, the acid test is, does it work? This is what William Barclay said about whether it works. He says, the proof of Christianity is that it works, that it does change men. He's talking back in the 70s or even earlier, uh, so he doesn't use gender-inclusive terminology. Apologies to the ladies. That it does change men. That it does make bad men good. That it does bring to men the spirit of God. It's when a man, man's words are guaranteed by his deeds that the world is presented with an argument for Christianity which will brook no denial. How genuine is your faith? Well, do your deeds show it? Do our deeds show it? Are we the kind of church that would be described by the rich vocabulary of Acts? Because we, we, we take to ourselves the name of Christian. Is Christ at the center of our life? We need to ask that. And we need to adjust our priorities by the Spirit of God, by God's grace, to make sure that it is so. So let us pray that these things will be so for us. I have a prayer that I wrote um, two days ago, which I thought I'd share with you, and then uh, we'll say the Lord's Prayer together. So uh, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that by the power of your Holy Spirit, your purposes for us and our world can be shaped by so small a thing as our conversations. We thank you for those who traveled from Cyprus and Cyrene to Antioch and entered into conversation with the Greeks of that ancient city 
and shared the message about Jesus. It is awesome to reflect that ever since that day, there have been people of non-Jewish background who have come into your kingdom. Lord Jesus Christ, we identify as Christians. We wear your name. We are complete in you. Keep your words alive in us so that our aspirations and attitudes resemble yours. Holy Spirit, shape us by your word so that our lives more and more resemble those of the Lord Jesus. Guide us day by day in the path that leads to life, life in all its fullness. We have seen the, dis the discipline of Olympic competitors in a whole range of pursuits. They do it for a crown that fades. Help us also to be disciplined, truly disciples, in our pursuit of un an unfading crown of righteousness. We have watched athletes from Nigeria, and we pray that the violence and hostage taking by Boko Haram in that country will come to an end. We have seen runners from Ethiopia, and pray that the war between Ethiopia and the Tigray and Eritrean people will end and that humanitarian aid will flow into that needy country. Spare Kenya from the violence of Al-Shabaab, fostered in Somalia and spreading south. Help us as Christians to support the cause of justice and especially to remember the poor as you have commanded. As COVID is, COVID is resurgent in Japan, we ask for mercy on citizens suffering distress and wisdom to the political leaders. We commit our political leaders to you. Grant the Prime Minister and the National Cabinet a renewed harmony in addressing the need for vaccination in Australia and the rise of infections in New South Wales and now Queensland. Help all who work in Christian mission remembering especially Andrew Adams in Japan, but also those in other places, Rosie Timmons, Kayser and Rahila Julius, Ross Maxwell, Warwick and Natalie Short, and Motor and Julia Yatt. We pray for all the bereaved, including the family of 38-year-old Brazilian finance worker, Adriana Midori Takara, who had to say goodbye to her father by Zoom. We remember elderly, vulnerable and sick friends this morning. Bring healing and comfort to them now, as in the silence of our hearts, we commit them to you. Enable them to cast their care on you, Lord, and to know that they matter to you. Help us all to enjoy being members of your family and to give you the praise and glory in our homes and among our friends. We ask this in the name of the one who taught us to pray together and to say, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 207, Christ is Made the Sure Foundation.
us pray. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit rest with you and with those whom you love and remain among us all now and evermore.